Boa tarde a todos, pessoal. Então, sejam bem-vindos à nossa última sessão de palestras, né, do módulo 4 da segunda ser 7 2021. Eu vou mudar agora para o inglês, tá? Para poder apresentar os nossos palestrantes é, da Rice University dos do Estados Unidos, tá certo? Uh, this afternoon at CERT SET 2021, uh, we're going to have uh, Professor Beth Bison Abimair and Professor Scott Solomon, both, both from Rice University. Uh, which title of the presentation will be Adapting Laboratory Courses to a Virtual Environment. So, uh, I will present uh, Professor Beth uh, Curriculum, which is, she is a teaching professor in the Department of Biosciences at Rice University in Houston, Texas, and a faculty fellow of the Rice Center for Teaching Excellence. She has developed multiple courses based undergraduate research experience and a student-centered integrative animal physiology course. Dr. Bison is a long-time judge for the International Genetic Engineering Machine, IGEM, competition and a member of the IGEM Executive Judging Committee. She is a past recipient of the George R. Brown Award for Superior Teaching and the Teaching Award for Excellence in Inquiry-Based Learning at Rice and has published in Advances in Physiology Education and the Journal of Microbiology and Biology Education. A National Academy's Education Mentor in the Life Science, Dr. Bison, is Chair of the American Physiological Society's 2022 Institute of Teaching and Learning, and is an Associate Editor for Advances in Physiology Education. She earned a BS in Microbiology from Auburn University and PhD in Physiology and Biophysics at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. So I would like to thank very much Professor Beth and Professor Scott uh, for accepting our, our invitation to present uh, here at CERCET, second CERCET 2021. So please, I will pass the, the word for Professor Beth. Thank you, Beth. The audio, the audio bit. Okay. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And I am very excited to be here today and share with you some of the things we did for our lab courses to adapt them to online learning. So I'm going to share my screen. Just go to full screen. Yeah, it's okay. 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 So just to give you a little bit of um, background about Rice. So Rice University is an R1 institution, even though we're small. And we are literally smack dab across the street from the Texas Medical Center. So a lot of our students end up doing research in the Texas Medical Center. Most of our undergraduate majors participate in research at some point during their education. So to prepare them for independent research and also ensure that all of them have an enriching research experience while they're undergrads, we've transformed most of our undergraduate lab courses into research-based courses. So rather than just learning about science, our students actually learn to do science. And our undergraduate laboratory program in biosciences introduces, builds, and reinforces the research and communication skills our students need to become expert thinkers. All of our lab courses are team-based and they emphasize the scientific process, not the content. So we're not so worried about them learning specific techniques. We want them to basically kind of understand how science works. And our um, lab courses, also are unique standalone modules. So since they're not associated with a specific lecture course, like a lot of undergrad lab courses are, then we have a lot of freedom and flexibility with how we design those courses. When the pandemic hit in the middle of the spring 2020 semester, we were forced to shift to online instruction literally within like a week. 
And so at that time, we implemented emergency measures to ensure that our students were able to complete their work and also earn credit for those lab courses that they were taking that semester. This crisis prompted us to really reflect upon what we thought was important about teaching and try to come up with solutions that would promote student engagement and learning, not just in a face-to-face -face environment, but in a virtual environment, which as you are aware, has a lot of challenges, especially with a lab course. So today, each of us will um, share a story of how we adapted two very different types of lab courses to a remote online format. So the course I would like to share with you is I teach an advanced laboratory that's primarily for juniors and seniors in experimental synthetic biology. And the nice thing about this course is it gives a creative outlet for students to kind of explore what they're really interested in. And the course is kind of designed around three main themes where we spend a lot of time reading and presenting the literature. So the primary literature about synthetic biology. They also work as a team to design a circuit. And then they also gain experience with basically how you would put this circuit together. And for most of the students taking this course, they've never, they've just heard of synthetic biology, but they haven't ever really worked with it. So this is an exciting opportunity for them. So the course goals for this course, since it's a lab course, as you can imagine, a couple of the course goals, the ones that are highlighted in blue, are focused on lab skills. So actually, what kind of skills do you need to do to perform research? And then what do you do when you experience experiments that don't work out the way that you thought they would? The other goals associated with this course are more focused on um, scientific process and are not necessarily dependent on being in the lab itself. And um, incidentally, I actually use the same course learning goals for all of my lab courses for first year students through um, upper level senior students. So it's just the expectations for what they are going to achieve with each of those goals differs depending on which course they're in. For the fall 2021 semester, I decided to teach this lab course fully online. And I realized from the beginning there were gonna be a couple of challenges, particularly would students still be able to achieve those course learning goals that were focused on lab work. So as I started redesigning the course, I started thinking about what were some ways that they still could acquire this even if they weren't physically in the lab. So I'm gonna share with you kind of how the course was before COVID and then the changes I made after COVID when I adapted it to online. So before COVID, the class would choose one project that they would pursue throughout the semester. So each team would design a project, come up with an idea they wanted to, to work on, and then they basically would kind of pitch it to the rest of the class. And um, then the class would vote and we would pick one project to move forward with. One of the primary reasons we had to do this is because of funds that it costs to support these projects. We just didn't have enough money for the, in our budget to basically let every team pursue whatever they wanted to. So we had to kind of pick a, pick a project as a class for them to follow. After COVID, because now we no longer had constraints of uh, money with supplies or for purchasing DNA, each team got to choose their own project. So they still shared it with the class, but instead of voting, the class gave them feedback to actually figure out how to make their class, their project better. And um, what I learned from this experience is how important project ownership is for students to be engaged and interested in what they're doing in the lab. So when I asked them to kind of reflect upon their experiences in this virtual environment and you know what, what they felt like they learned, um, this was some of the feedback I got from the students. One student commented how difficult every part of the, the development of the project was from basically coming up with the idea in the first place, designing an experiment, and then kind of figuring out what types of methods they would use if they were to pursue this project. And they said, they've said that this is like the first time they've ever seen what happens on those initial stages. A lot of our students do research, but they basically join a lab 
that already has established projects going on and they just kind of pick up where someone else has left off. So this gave them a chance to actually start at it from the, from the front side. They liked being able to start really broad and pick their own topic and then narrow it down. And then one student commented how this was the first course um, that she had taken where she had the freedom to pick something based on her personal interests. So she was able, she's a planning on going to medical school. And so she was able to basically tie in her interest in medicine into her project for this class. Before COVID, the students worked on design for the first seven weeks, which is about the first half of our semester. And then in the second half of the semester, they went into the lab and they attempted to build their circuit mostly unsuccessfully, but they at least tried for seven weeks to try to put it together. And one of the um, issues with this structure for the course is that the development of the project was really compressed in those first three weeks. So they hit the ground running and had to come up with an idea very quickly, share it with the rest of the class, the class would vote, and then the class would design the DNA. So it was very very heavy skewed towards the very first part of the semester with coming up with the idea. And then at the end of the semester, they submitted an individual um, research progress report that described kind of how what progress they'd made through the semester. After COVID, we spent the entire semester working on design. So um, the advantage of this was that students had multiple opportunities to reflect upon and refine their projects. So they didn't have to basically um, come up with the idea really fast, and then that's what they used for the whole semester. It actually just developed over the course of the semester, and basically we went through an um, iterative process where they would get feedback from me, they would refine their project, I'd give them more feedback, and we just kind of, and they got to share and present their work with their peers. And then at the end of the semester, instead of submitting a progress report, they submitted a team research proposal. So basically, everything they would need to do their project um, was submitted as in the form of a proposal. After COVID, it also gave us the opportunity to bring an expert in the field to give six guest lectures. So Dr. Carmela Haynes is a colleague of mine that I've known for many years through the iGEM um, competition. And she's at Emory University, which is in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, physically, she would not have been able to visit us for six times during the semester. But because we were meeting in Zoom, she actually would just join the class and basically share with them kind of from each stage of a project how you would actually develop this. So this was a very valuable addition to the class. Another thing we did after COVID is I had the students lead their own biotechnology review panel. So I had them watch a video from the National Science Foundation about how you review and score grants. And then the students built their own rubric based on intellectual merit and broader impact. And then they reviewed several projects that were just posted online on the iGEM website. And then we actually spent three days working on this panel where they would describe the idea um, and then strengths and weaknesses. And then they would actually assign it a priority score as if they were the funding agency. So this was a really valuable experience for them because it gave them a chance to critically evaluate the work of others. So if we go back to my original lab goals and my question, how could students still achieve their learning goals for lab work? When I was thinking about how could they still possess skills desired of an independent researcher, a couple of ways I thought they might meet this would be because they had to look at protocols, they had to think about methods, they had to think about how they would actually share that data. In their research proposal, they had to describe what experimental approaches they would take to build and test their circuit. You know, what are the DNA sequences? What would they measure as output? How would they measure it? What equipment and materials would they need? Um, you know, how would they implement their system in the real world? So once they built this thing, how would they actually deploy it out in the real world? So all of this went into the research proposal. And I gave them a prompt on a reflection where I basically asked them, what is something specific that you did observe or learned that shows that you successfully accomplished one or more of the course learning goals? And one of the students said that he felt like he had achieved this learning goal about possessing laboratory skills, because in order to put this proposal together, 
And in order to design this project and plan everything that would happen, he had to really understand what methods they would need, what sort of data they would collect, how they would actually share that information. So it was much more than just, you know, saying we're going to do this. He had to really understand all the rationale. Similarly, for experience that not all scientific experiments worked as planned, um, I already mentioned how the students did the biotechnology panel, so they were able to actually look at the work of other students. But when I asked them this same question, almost half the class said that they felt like they had achieved this learning goal. And here's just a couple of examples. One student um, said this one was the most impactful, one of the most impactful learning goals for her because their initial project idea changed over time as they experienced roadblocks. And so actually having to work through those roadblocks and think about how they would move forward really helped her achieve this learning goal. And then another student responded that when they wrote their paper um, for actually the design of their project, they realized that their initial project idea wasn't that good. So they basically scrapped their initial idea and started all over. So he felt like even though you know, they even though he wasn't ever in the lab, that he still was able to experience this uh, or achieve this learning goal. And at this time, I would like to turn the presentation over to my colleague, Scott Solomon, and he is going to talk about what he did with his courses. And then um, I'll join you back. I'll join back at the end to um, for some final reflections. Well, pessoal, vamos continuar essa apresentação. Now to continue this uh, presentation, we're going to have uh, Dr. Uh, Scott Solomon, also from uh, the Rice University in Houston, United States. Dr. Scott Solomon is a biologist, professor, and science communicator. He teaches ecology, evolutionary biology, and scientific communication as an associate teaching professor at Rice University in Houston. He's also a member of the uh, NSF, International Research. Uh, uh, he, he was a fellow there at the NSF, at the Department of Entomology, at the uh, Smithsonian Institution and was at Washington, DC. Uh, he has been uh, in Brazil as, as well, uh, at the uh, University Estadual Paulista, UNESP in Rio Claro, uh, not far from São Carlos, in fact. Uh, he has also uh, worked at the University of Texas in Austin, where he got his uh, bachelor degree, uh, actually his uh, bachelor in science in, in cell and structural biology. After that, he was at the Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign. And he has also worked as, a, well, he is now in Houston, sorry. Uh, he teaches undergrad courses in introductory biology, laboratory courses in ecology and evolutionary biology, and a seminar course on public science communication. He has taught field biology courses in Texas, Belize, in Colorado, and he has developed a complete digital lecture series on modern science and evolution with the great courses. Uh, Dr. Solomon's research examines the ecology and evolution of ants, um, and the coevolution between ants and microbes. He's a, he's a member of the American Association for Advancement of Science, the Society for the Study of Evolution, and he's uh, also an, the, uh, an, an associate editor for the journal Tropical Biology. So now I'll pass the word then to uh, Dr. Uh, Scott, please, you can assume from here. I think your mic is muted. Can you hear me now? Yep, yeah, it's fine. Wonderful, thanks. Thank you so much for uh, for having me. And um, I'm gonna uh, see if I can get my slides to uh, to show here. I'm having some difficulties with uh, with getting my um, getting the connection here. So let me just see. Try one more time if I can share.
yeah, I'm not able to share my slides. So Beth, I wonder if it's possible for you to, uh, if you have my slides, if she can show those while I, while I speak, I, I'm not sure if there's another good solution, but I, I'm, it's telling me that I don't have the ability to share my slides. Sorry about that. There's an application window there. You can actually share your screen from there. Yeah, but I, I, I'm uh, connected through my phone and through my computer. Oh, I see. My uh, phone doesn't have the slides, so I have to share the slides. Probably can uh, actually uh, show their slides. Yeah. yeah, let me see. If this works. No. So, Beth, do you have a, still have a copy of my slides? Yep. And then if you will just tell me when to advance, yeah, because um, I'm going to lose your I'm going to lose your video when or your face when I share. So I'll, I'll just I'll just let you know when I, I need I, the next slide. So while she's getting that pulled up, yeah. Oh, great. There we go. So okay. um, so again, and, and can you hear me OK? Yeah. Okay, great. So thank you again for this opportunity. It's it's a treat for me to get to to in, interact with with you all because um, as you heard in my introduction, I've um, I've spent time in Brazil. I was in Rio Claro for um, about a year or so, and um, my wife is originally from Ribeirão Preto, and so uh, we go back and and visit family there as often as we can and. Uh, I've been to Sao Carlos many times. I have a, a good friend who's uh, from Sao Carlos, and um, uh, it's a it's a lovely place, and and it's a great uh, honor to get to 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 share some of my work with all of you. So, um, as you heard from my colleague Dr. Beeson, we are are teaching um, lab courses at Rice in a way that is. Um, a little bit non-traditional. And for the work that I do in ecology and evolutionary biology, one of the aspects that we really try to emphasize is getting students out of the classroom and out into natural ecosystems where they're interacting with living organisms in their natural context. Um, and as you can imagine, that poses a particular challenge for doing these lab courses in a virtual setting. So I wanna talk a little bit about some of the ways that I've been adapting these courses to the virtual setting. Um, so one of the classes that I teach is an introductory lab course in ecology and evolutionary biology. So this course is uh, the course that students have to take before they move into the upper level, more advanced laboratory courses. And one thing that we always do in this lab is take students to a local natural area and have them measure the biological diversity of arthropods like insects and um, other, other uh, little creatures that they can find uh, living in the prairie and a forest ecosystem. And what they do is they take a collection of soil and leaves and bring it back to the lab and they set those up in these, um, these contraptions here. This is called a Berlazi funnel. And it's just a plastic soda bottle. So like a Coca-Cola bottle that we've cut the top off of the lid and turned it upside down and put a light on top. And uh, we put some alcohol, some ethanol in the bottom here. And the idea is that the insects will crawl down and become trapped and preserved in the alcohol. And then the students would normally go through those samples and use a microscope to try to identify what types of organisms they collected. And basically with that technique, they can then quantify the amount of biological diversity that they see in these different ecosystems. And so obviously we can't take students out into, um, into the field when we're doing this course in a virtual setting. So I had to, to really figure out how do we achieve the most important learning objectives 
here while allowing students to do this type of activity wherever they happen to be. Some of our students are uh, living on campus, but others are living at home in all different uh, places all across the United States and in fact in, in other countries as well, so around the world. So what, uh, uh, so Beth, you could go to the next slide now. So what I, I came up with is um, rather than focusing on insects and other arthropods, we decided to have the students assess the biological diversity of the food that makes up our diets. So rather than sampling in a prairie or a forest, now the students are sampling wherever they have food stored. So this could be in their refrigerator or in a pantry, any place where they've got food. And we have them going through and doing a systematic survey where they will say, go to the second shelf and go to the third item from the left and select that item. And then they have to figure out what are the ingredients within that food? So it's easiest if they can read a label. So if they have food where the ingredients are listed, they have to then look up what is the organism that that ingredient came from. So with something like, you know, rice, that's going to be easy. You just look up what species is rice. But if you're working with something a bit more complex, like, um, say bread, well, then you need to look up, okay, what's in the bread? Well, you've got the flour. What does that come from? It comes from wheat. So what species is wheat? What about the yeast? What species does that come from? And so they're fi figuring out what are the living things that make up our diets. And then they can apply the same methods for quantifying the diversity of those species as they would have done if they were looking at insects living in a prairie. So the, the question that we're asking here is a completely different question, but the tools and the approach that they're using is actually essentially the same in this example. And next slide. So I wonder if you can guess what was the most common species that they found in the, these surveys. This was sort of an interesting uh, statement on what goes into our, our, our diets. Uh, next, Beth. It turned out that the most common species that they found was sugar cane. In other words, sugar is the most common ingredient uh, in the diets of our students. Probably not a huge surprise there. I think probably the students would have uh, maybe guessed that in advance, but it was still interesting to see. So they found 427 different ingredients, 116 species total, and sugarcane um, is the most common of those. Next slide. Whoops, you can uh, go back one. Yep, thank you, great. So. Uh, that was an introductory lab course. I also teach um, a, an advanced laboratory course called Biological Diversity. And in this course, we kind of take that idea that you saw in the introductory class, and we spend an entire semester doing a deeper dive into the ways in which ecologists measure biological diversity in natural ecosystems. So normally in this course, what we would do is we would go out to um, a different natural area. This is a, a, a national preserve, the Big Thicket National Preserve in East Texas. And we spend the entire semester trying to quantify the biological diversity of different groups of organisms. And those include plants, fungi, reptiles, amphibians, birds, mammals, fish, all different organisms. And the students normally would come up with their own methodology. So they have to do some research to figure out what is the best way to survey fish or what is the best way to survey and identify fungi or frogs, whatever group that they are working with, they have to figure out how to do that uh, type of survey. And then in the, uh, the middle of the semester, we would normally go out and we would spend an entire weekend in this place and actually carry out the survey that the students have designed. And then what they would do normally is spend the rest of the semester analyzing the results of their survey and also sharing those results. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. So one of the ways that we share the results of those surveys 
is through the website iNaturalist. So this is a, a website that anyone can access um, and anyone can share observations of species that they've seen. So if you go on a hike and you see a particular type of bird, maybe you take a picture of the bird, maybe not, but if you um, are able to identify it, you can say, hey, I saw this species of bird at this place at this time. And then you can share that observation with, um, with the world through iNaturalist. So it's a really nice website because it allows people to share their observations, but they also can get feedback about whether those observations are in fact correct. Um, you can go um, maybe to the next two or three slides. So you can see some pictures here um, next where students have posted photos of different groups of organisms that they have seen in the surveys that they've done. And these are geotagged. So with their, um, their cameras, they're taking a picture, they can just use their cell phones for this as well. Um, and it records the place and the time. And so what we get is this really nice database of different species that have been found in this particular region. Um, and people will comment on whether they think the species identification is correct or if they want to propose um, a different species name. Generally, our students do pretty good at, at identifying these species correctly um, with some help from, from experts. Uh, we also normally share the results of these surveys with the, um, the National Park Service, so the, the uh, organization that uh, runs and maintains these parks is also interested in the results of the surveys that these students do. And I think this has been an important part of this class because the students know that they're not just turning in an assignment that their instructor, the professor is going to read. They know that other people are actually going to be looking at the results of what they find. And I think that allows the students to really take ownership of the project, to take it seriously, and to see the value of the work that they're doing. Next slide. So clearly we couldn't do this uh, this year in, in a virtual context. So what I did instead is I had the students go back and analyze the surveys that students have done in previous years. So they actually did a meta-analysis of the data collected by students over the past seven years or so. And what they were able to do by doing that is actually look for trends in how the diversity of different groups of organisms has maybe changed over that time period. Um, it also gives you a better sense of what is actually living out there by not just looking at a snapshot from one particular year, but over um, a number of years in sequence. So what you can see here is some examples of data from, um, from mammals. So you can see that the most common species of mammal is the uh, deer followed by a squirrel and then another squirrel. <laughs> and then there's a lot of rare species like our uh, famous Texas armadillos. Um, but when we looked at the diversity of these mammals and other species across years, in some cases, there were some interesting patterns. So if you look at the top right here, you can see how the diversity of mammals changed from year to year. And you can see that in 2017, there was a big drop in the diversity of mammals. And then it went up again the next time we surveyed mammals two years later in 2019. And in fact, what happened in 2017 is we had a big hurricane that struck the, um, the region, Hurricane Harvey, which led to uh, some devastating flooding. Um, it was a really, really bad storm. It caused a flooding throughout Southeast Texas. A lot of people uh, lost their homes, including myself, in fact. Our house flooded and was destroyed. We had to rebuild the house. Um, but for animals living out in uh, the forest without any high place to go, this was also apparently a very devastating event. And we see that in the data because we see the decline in mammals in 2017. And when the students compared the diversity of mammals before Hurricane Harvey, with the diversity after Hurricane Harvey, you can see in the bottom right graph, there was in fact a uh, significant difference in the diversity of mammals 
um, at least in the one year that we have data for after Harvey compared to all the years that we had before Harvey. So that was actually a really interesting thing that we couldn't get the normal way that we uh, would do this class. We actually learned something by doing this meta-analysis that, that the students wouldn't have been able to learn by doing this the normal way. So there was actually kind of a neat advantage to doing it this way. Next slide. Um, another thing I wanted to, to preserve and, and continue to have a way for the students to, um, to have their assignments for this class be used by people other than just their professor. <laughs> so I wanted there, there to still be some product that the students produce that is useful to the, the broader community. And so what we did was um, I had the students develop some online resources. So they developed a, um, a website in which they shared information about some of the species that are found in the Big Thicket region. And so uh, they developed this website. Um, uh, one of the things that they also did was to develop um, a field guide. So you can, you can go to the next um, couple of slides here, Beth. So you've got some uh, examples of, that's great, uh, examples here of, um, uh, in addition to the website, they produced a PDF document that has information about a lot of the individual species um, that we know live in the big thicket, thanks to the surveys that the students have done. And the nice thing about this PDF is that we can print this out and make copies of it available at the uh, park itself. And so one of the things that we're hoping to do um, is to, is to uh, be able to print enough copies so that this can be something that people can just pick up when they start going on a hike um, and they can take it with them and use it as a field guide so that they can identify species that they see and, um, and learn a little bit about those species. So I think the students actually did a really nice job in developing these resources. And again, it's still something that they are, um, uh, are contributing that isn't just a class assignment. It's something that lives on um, uh, even once the class is done. Next slide. Another thing that we did in that class this, this year was to take advantage of the fact that we were um, meeting remotely to invite guest speakers to meet with the class and talk about different aspects of the work that they do that relates to biological diversity. So in much the same way that we are right now uh, benefiting from being able to communicate uh, across continents, and maybe we wouldn't have done this is if, um, if we weren't all getting so used to having these virtual meetings. Um, so in the same way, I invited um, a, a, a number of different guest speakers to come in and speak with the students about work that they do in quantifying biodiversity in different ecosystems around the world, work that they do related to the conservation of biological diversity in different places. Um, and each of them works with a different group of organisms or a different part of the world or has a focus more on uh, different applications of what the students were learning about. So I think this was actually a really nice addition to the class and one that I think we may try to, um, to preserve even once we go back to um, uh, normal in-person classes again. Next slide. So... To kind of wrap things up here, um, that 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 concludes what I wanted to say about my my specific classes. Um, but what we thought we would do here at the end, and I'll invite Beth to to join in as well with uh, with um, insights from her class, is to think about how each of our courses, it, it, the the philosophies behind how we adapted each of our courses to a virtual environment. Um, I think causes us to think about what is actually most important when we are designing classes in general. So we developed a, a series here of guiding principles that I think are useful um, in, in adapting these courses to a virtual environment. But I would argue that these are also useful just in designing courses for any context. So let me say a few things about um, kind of what what we mean by, by each of these points here. And um, so the first thing is prioritizing supporting students. So one of the things that I've certainly come to, to appreciate um, in the last year is that we really need to make it clear to our students that we are here to help them and support them with 
their learning, yes, but also with what they're going through. And it's certainly been clear to me that the students appreciate this. And I think it really helps them to, to learn when they understand that they are, um, are, are being supported by their, their professors. So the ways that I've tried to do this include um, starting off the course by saying things like, hey, I understand this is a very, very challenging time and I welcome your suggestions for what you think we can do um, you know, to, to make this as valuable a learning experience as possible. So I try to make it clear that I, you know, I, I'm doing my best, but I don't necessarily have all the answers and I'm open to suggestions from them. I'm also really trying to go out of my way to meet with the students virtually, but one-on-one uh, but -on -one or in small groups to try to get to know the students and to help them to, to recognize that, um, that I'm really there to try to support them in whatever way I can. Beth, did you want to add anything about the prioritizing supporting students? Yes. Am I, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So to add to what Scott said, um, I learned the value of how important it was to really build a community. And this is much harder to do in a virtual environment than it is in person when we're meeting with them, you know, face to face regularly. So trying to think of ways to, as Scott said, make sure that you know, we are aware of their needs and reaching out to them and finding ways to balance um, flexibility, expectations and rigor. So not not that we have to basically, you know, stop doing the stop, change our learning goals so we don't you know, have the same level, but to basically um, be open to, you know, thinking of different flexible ways we can be to to help them achieve their goals. So varying the types of assignments like both Scott and I did. Um, even dropping assignments that normally they would have done and being flexible with things like due dates. Yeah, that flexibility, I think, is is a real key too, right? So, you know, we've just had um, here in Texas this last week has been a, a really extreme uh, weather situation that um, you may have seen in the news. Uh, I understand it's been the international news, what the Texas weather has been because it's been so cold and we've lost um, power and water uh, across much of the state. Um, and so this has forced us to, you know, once again, um, uh, be very flexible in, um, in our due dates. Uh, you know, uh, we're, we're extending the dates for, for many of our assignments. Um, and I think it's, it, you know, it, it just it is very important when the students recognize that uh, we're not just trying to force them to do work that we really are understanding and want to um, want to allow them to do their best work. Um, oftentimes, that means that it's going to be turned in much later than was originally planned. So the second point here, thinking broadly about learning goals, I think you saw a lot of examples of this in both um, Beth's presentation and, and in my own where we really change the nature of what the students are doing, but they still are able to get the most important learning goals out of these assignments. So for, for my, uh, in my own case, right, switching from studying the diversity of arthropods in a prairie to the diversity of ingredients in our diet, it's a totally different question. But what is it that at the end of the day, I want my students to really get out of this lab? You know, for me, it's much more important that they think about how do we quantify diversity? How do we measure it? And how do we sample it in a way that actually is representative and isn't biased in some way? And those same principles apply no matter what we're, whether it's food in our diets or whether it's arthropods in a prairie. So yes, they're missing out on some of the experiences and some of the techniques that they would learn in, in you know, doing field work or in working with a microscope in my case, but, um, but I think they're much, um, it, I think it's much more important that they get those um, uh, bigger picture goals of being able to quantify diversity. Beth, did you wanna add something about learning goals for your courses? Yeah, I think for, for my course, it was um, important for me to just recognize and accept that it wouldn't be possible for me to replicate online the exact same experience that they would have had in the lab. Um, so it gave me an opportunity to focus on 
other learning goals and outcomes and try to think of creative ways that they could still achieve those. And I also um, tried to remember that this isn't the only lab course that they're going to take. They're going to have other opportunities to um, as they progress throughout our program. And, you know, as Scott said, the it's not about the techniques. It's more about the way they think and they how they work with things. And they um, they really surprised me when they actually on their um, reflections picked two of the learning goals that I was thinking, how in the world are they ever going to achieve this when they're not in the lab? And they they did. They re they were able to to think about like, oh, well, even though I didn't actually do this technique, I had to do a lot of research and understand how it would work and what I would need in order to do it. So that was um, that was very, reassur very rewarding and and um, reassuring to me that my students still felt like they were able to learn what we wanted them to learn. So the third guiding principle is to give the students the resources that they need to succeed. And I think in some ways this might be the most challenging aspect of switching to the remote format. At least I, it has been for me because of course, normally we would give them resources in the classroom. They would come into the lab and we would be giving them pieces of equipment or we would be giving them um, you know, uh, tools that they would be using in order to complete an assignment. And of course we can't do that in the remote format. So, you know, I've had to be creative in my courses and, um, and trying to figure out ways that students can complete assignments on their own. One of the things that I've used quite a bit is uh, websites and apps. So smartphone apps where students can um, download a free app that would allow them to do something like use their phone as a magnifying glass um, or even like a small microscope. There's apps that allow students to measure things with their phones. So they might not have, um, you know, the, the tools that we would normally have in the lab, but they can use um, their smartphones to, to do many of the things that, uh, maybe not quite as well, but they, but they can at least um, get the same general idea. Um, oh, we lost our slides. Uh you, you yeah. have something else uh, in the slides? Well, we just wanted to, I think, talk about this, this, these last points here. So points uh, four and five here. That's weird because it's still showing up. Let me stop and then try to reshare. It was sharing a bit. Yeah, it was, it was okay. Beth, it just reappeared and then disappeared just now. There we go. It's back. Hi. Perfect. Um, Beth, did you want to say something about the resources for your classes? Yes. So thinking about resources they might need other than, you know, equipment or reagents for the lab, um, something as, you know, making sure they know how to use our library to basically search for and access primary literature. So it's something that I just kind of assumed that they would be able to do that. But then I realized a lot of students didn't know that you know, they could log into our library and basically have access to all these things that are published. So um, making sure they know how to do that. Um, having them like use Google Docs for collaborations and making sure they shared those with me so I could actually see um, as they're working on developing their projects. And then we also um, took advantage for the virtual environment of using the, um, the website that's set up by the iGEM competition because there are like, years of student projects with data, with, you know, slides, with information for them. And so basically using that as a resource for them to learn a lot about synthetic biology. And one of the things they really enjoyed is I had them pick their favorite iGEM project and share it with the class. And it was really funny because two students actually picked the exact same project. And um, but they gave a different way of they presented it in a slightly different you know, emphasis in a different twist. So taking advantage, as Scott said, of, of things that are out there, either on the internet or on apps that they can use to actually um, still achieve those learning goals. So the fourth guiding principle is to create learning experiences that motivate and inspire. And so, you know, I mentioned in my uh, advanced lab course that one of the, the things that we try to do is to create assignments that are, um, uh, not just for turning in and getting a grade, but they're creating products that um, are used by other people, by the National Park Service and by 
um, other researchers potentially in the case of their iNaturalist observations. And I think that really does help to motivate the students to, 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 to put a lot of effort into making these products um, as good as they can possibly be. Um, and I think, you know, the fact that they're doing research that is, is authentic, it is real research. We don't know what they're going to find when they go out and they do these uh, surveys in the, uh, in the examples that I showed you. Um, so I think that, and, and you know, feedback from the students suggests that they really do get excited about doing this work when they know that it's not just an exercise that they're doing for a grade, they're actually doing this um, and, and they're solving an, a, a mystery or they're, they're collecting information and they'll have um, answers that nobody else has. They, they get excited about that. And <clears throat> so trying to find ways in which we can preserve those aspects of these courses has been a really important uh, guiding principle for me as I try to think about adapting these uh, to online format. Beth? Yeah, and for, for the lab course that I gave the example of, and also it applies to um, my other lab courses that are advanced as well as at the intro level, is giving students ownership of their learning is really crucial to basically having them be really interested and engaged in the project. And um, for the synthetic biology lab, I really did not give them, you know, I gave them feedback, but not until they had come up with the idea. And we started with, I had an assignment they worked on as a group where they basically just thought like, okay, if we could solve any problem in the world using synthetic biology, what would be local problems we wanted to solve? What would be national problems we wanted to solve? What would be global problems we wanted to solve? And that's where they started. And then they narrowed it down to an idea. And then they were like, okay, let's go see what's been done on this. And so basically giving them the chance to just, you know, kind of go after what they're interested in and see like what it would take was extremely valuable. And, you know, the advantage we had this semester with my doing it online is every group got to actually pursue what they were most interested in. Whereas before when we had to, it had to be much more constrained because of resources, but money was not an option this time. And I basically told them they had an unlimited budget and, you know, they needed to actually think about what it would cost, but basically, you know, not to let, not to be worried about time or worried about money to basically just think like, okay, what would it take for us to achieve this goal? And so I think that was extremely valuable for them to do that. So the last of our guiding principles is to consider new opportunities. In other words, think about what it is that you may be able to do in the virtual format that you actually wouldn't be able to do using the traditional in-person format. And so I, I, as I, I mentioned in my classes, the main thing that I've um, been doing is to invite guest speakers um, and including guest speakers from, from you know, all different parts of the world. And I, I really do think that has been um, a, a, a real advantage uh, of the, the format. I think it's the students have gotten a lot out of those interactions in terms of learning and also in terms of networking, in terms of meeting um, people that they may um, develop some sort of a, a professional relationship with in the future. So, um, so, so this is something that I think, you know, as each of us think about how we can take advantage of the online format. There may be things that that you can do better online than what you'd be able to do um, in person. Beth, yeah, and for um, the similarly for me, the guest speaker was a extremely valuable part of this course. And even when we move back to in person, I plan on inviting her to continue to interact with the class if she's interested in doing so. Um, Another new opportunity was because I realized they weren't going to be able to get into the lab um, was I took what would have been like a, a lab research project and turned it into a proposal. And many students said this was the first time they had ever been on that design in where they had to really think about what would go into actually achieving this. And so having to go through the whole process from what do we do research on? What's our question to how would we actually make this in the lab? And, you know, what's the budget we would need in order to achieve this was valuable for a lot of them. So a lot of them are, some of them are going to grad school. Uh, many of them are interested in medical school. And so these, this was a different experience for them 
uh, being able to just think about that side. And I know when the semester started, um, some of the students were a little concerned because they thought it was kind of weird that they were, you know, learning about synthetic biology without doing anything in the lab. Um, and based on my experience with previous classes before this, I, they actually learned a lot more than when we did this before. I mean, just as an example, typically on their progress reports, I might get three to five references from the primary literature if I was lucky. Um, for their research proposal, there were some teams that had 20 plus references all from the primary literature. So they actually really taught themselves. They learned a lot more about synthetic biology in this virtual environment. And that was something that I did not anticipate when we started, but um, I was I was really pleased with at the end. Yeah, so so that uh, is is basically you know concludes the the prepared remarks that we had. So we thought uh, these guiding principles were things that um, both Beth and I found um, to be useful in thinking about adapting laboratory courses to a virtual environment, but also things that are generally helpful as guiding principles for developing any type of, of, of course. So we can go ahead and um, answer questions. I think Do you want us to address some of the questions that are in the chat. Yes, uh, if you if you have finished. Uh, we, would, we would like to thank you very much for this uh, very joyful presentation. And I think that the guidelines that you presented in the end are, are really, really important to, to guide us in the engineering and technological courses to, in order to try to, to do our lab classes. So it was really nice. So uh, the idea now, if it's okay for you, we can uh, start like a, a round table, a virtual round table. And Freddy and me, we are going to, to uh, divide the, the questions for you, okay? So uh, first one, first question, which kind of difficulties can the students have regarding online lab classes or courses? So I, I think, for me, what I've found is the biggest difficulty is it's much harder for me to see what the students are doing as they're doing it and to try to intervene and make um, basically to identify what the problems are before they turn in their work. Right. So normally we would be all together in the classroom or out in the field. They'd be doing something and I can go around and I can see what they're doing. I can ask them questions. They can ask me questions. And it's much more difficult for us to do that. So I'm seeing problems arise only after they've turned in some assignment. And it's harder to go back and figure out what went wrong early in the in the process. I think they also struggle from not being able to work together as easily. And it's the same, it's the same kind of a, a, an issue there. Yeah, my, my students had similar difficulties. Um, what helped is because we were using Zoom for our classes, then I was able to put them in breakout rooms so they were able to interact with their small team. And then what a lot of my students did is they just kind of set up their own virtual meetings outside of scheduled class time. And so that way they were still able to interact. And but I wasn't able to but the, the breakout rooms in Zoom are really nice and I could still go visit with each team. But what was lost was kind of, you know, visiting with everyone all at once in the big space where then I'd hear like, oh, they have a great idea. Let me share this with the class. Right. So it was much harder to do virtually because then when we were meeting as whole class we got a little bit of that back but it wasn't quite as um natural it was more like you know they almost had to really think about what they were going to say in front of the class so it was a little bit awkward not there there was no the, the the spontaneity was lost so kind of the excitement when they're just like the light bulb goes on in their head and they're like oh i have a great idea i want to tell the whole class that was kind of lost in the virtual environment and then the other, another um, challenge, I think, is basically the student's mindset of, be, of basically seeing that a, just because the class is online doesn't mean it's not a lab. And it doesn't mean that just because they're not going to be, you know, picking up a pipetter and, you know, 
are growing a cell or going out in the field and collecting a sample, it doesn't mean they're not still achieving um, important learning goals. And so I think that's getting that past that kind of um, like mental block in the students um, took us probably a couple of weeks. So then once they realized like, oh, this is a lab and I am learning, then it got a little, it got a lot easier. So. Okay. Fred? Well, it's very interesting. Uh, very interesting to, to hear from you that they are, that the students are actually learning more than in the present laboratory. That's quite a surprise to us. And uh, would like you to comment on that. But before before you comment on that, there's, we have another question here concerning uh, the material you have used in this uh, this experiment, you know, remote experiment in your teaching laboratory. Uh, did you use some sort of you know videos from previous experiments from laboratories from your university or other universities for the students? So I did not in my course because I shifted the focus to be more kind of the design and development. Um, I do have a colleague at Rice who is teaching um, a microbiology lab and he's also teaching an electrophysiology lab and he makes recordings of him actually doing the experiments and shares those with his students. So they're able, they're, they don't get the hands-on experience, but they are able to see him do that. And I know there are a lot of universities that are recording things and, um, you know, and my students, my, my TAs actually, um, you know, offered to make some videos if we needed them. So there, there are, we do have the cameras and stuff to do that. I just haven't done it for my classes, but my colleague has. Scott. Yeah, I think what we've had to figure out is how important are the techniques that students would learn in each of these classes? And in some cases, like in the colleagues that, that um, Beth was mentioning, the techniques really are an important part of the class. That's one of the, the, uh, the important learning objectives is to know how to do these laboratory techniques. And then you have to figure out how can the students learn those techniques when they're not doing them themselves. Um, in my classes, I decided that the techniques were not what was so important and that, you know, if they go on and take other courses in the future, maybe they can learn some of those techniques. But uh, I felt it was much more important to focus on the, the thinking like a scientist, right? Thinking about how to design an experiment, analyze data, interpret data, communicate results. Those aspects for my classes were more important than the techniques themselves. So I just decided I'm not gonna worry about trying to teach these students the techniques that they would be learning. We'll, we'll allow them to do that in the future in some other classes that hopefully they can take in person. Yeah, that was similarly for my class. We actually focused on, um, I think throughout the course of the semester, they gave maybe four, at least four presentations um, some of them were really short. A couple of them were team presentations. They had to do an individual presentation. So they still were they still were talking about science data and and sharing it and communicating it. But that I really shifted the focus to be more design and then how you would communicate that as opposed to how you would actually do it. Um, do I do this one, Fred? Yeah, yeah, I'll do the next one. Uh, do you think it's worth it to use uh, work groups in online lab classes or just individually it's possible? What do you think about it? So all of, uh, most of our lab courses at Rice are all team-based and I kept the team-based aspect and that was, that was essential. So um, the when I actually asked them to give me feedback when they were preparing their um, proposal and also when they were preparing presentations and kind of tell me like who contributed what and there were some people that were that were really um felt really comfortable looking up a method they'd never done and basically digging around and see like oh how would we actually do this right there were other people that actually looked up the background information and so the keeping that team focus and these are small teams my teams are like three to four students so keeping that small group together um, made a made for a more enriching experience for all of them. They give joint presentations, so they're you know it's, it's the individual part. I think would have been a lot more stressful. Um, 
in, in a normal lab environment, the individual the, the part would be stressful. And especially in this virtual environment, I think it would have been even more because then they would have been doing all this work just themselves. But by having a team-based um, approach, they were able to kind of share the workload. So I think that was crucial for, um, for at least for my classes. And I've done it both ways, actually. So in my introductory lab course, the students would normally work in groups on most of their assignments, but I decided that it was more important for me to give them flexibility right now to allow them to complete the assignments whenever they want and wherever they want. And I felt that if I was going to have them work in groups, it would remove some of that flexibility. It would, it would make it harder for them to really, um, uh, you know, take advantage of the, the, the extended time period I'm giving them and the flexibility to do the work where, where they want as well. Um, so in, the, in that introductory course, I, I, I'm having the students just work individually on all of the assignments. Uh, in my advanced lab course, the biodiversity lab, we are continuing to do group work. And I think that for the most part, that has been a good thing. I will uh, note though that in at least one case, I'm aware that there was a group that had some real problems and that happens, right? Anybody that's taught classes with group work knows that uh, often there can be um, some conflicts uh, between individual group members, even just under normal circumstances. But I think that it's exaggerated now. And, and without going into too many details, I think what happened in this case was one of the students in one of the groups had some kind of emergencies or, or crises that were happening with him or his family. And he wasn't able to participate the way that he normally would. And he communicated that to me, but he didn't communicate it very well to his group members. And so they got frustrated that he wasn't doing what he sh would normally be doing. He felt bad and it didn't, you know, really get to have the same experience. I was trying to respect the student's privacy, support him, but also help everybody to, to complete the assignment. And so I think it added a lot of stress in the case of that one group that I, you know, I don't know in, the, in hindsight if I think it would have been better to not do the group assignment or maybe to intervene a little bit more. But I just point out that I think all of the challenges of group work still exist in a virtual format, but they may be exaggerated because, not just because of the group, not just because of the remote format, but because so many people are just going through a lot of stress and have other things going up and they're not always comfortable sharing what uh about the details of all of those things yeah very interesting well the next question is uh you might have already know a comment on, on the on the answer for the next question next question uh which is about assessment how how do I, you are actually uh doing the assessments for individual students I, I believe that they are working remotely among themselves as well when I'm talking about the groups. And uh, how, and for, for complementing, how can you say, or how did you measure uh, the, the evolution, individual evolution? And why can you say, why are you saying that, you know, uh, they're learning more than in the present, uh, in, in the presential, you know, mode? So for my class, um, yes, I imagine most of the groups were working remotely. Um, some of them were on campus, so they might have met up, but it was probably easier for them to, to meet remotely. Um, as far as individual progress, a lot of this course was team-based um, um, products, so team-based assessment, but um, a huge component of all of my courses are individual um, reflections where I basically want them to basically think about what they've learned, how they're learning, you know, what are they struggling with and to give me feedback about that. And so I have multiple individual, um, those types of assessments throughout the semester. And so I'm able to see from their feedback, you know, kind of how they're making progress and what their level of understanding is. Um, and additionally, when, even with the team assignments, as I said, 
they had to basically tell me like who worked on what part. And so then I would be able to see if they were struggling with a certain, um, you know, aspect of the project. Uh, and then when they were giving presentations in class, those were, you know, I saw I saw the slides they produced. I saw, you know, were they able to answer questions from me and the classmates? And so the um, the, the assessment actually for the online for for my course was not that much different than what it would be in person. I was able to shift a lot of this stuff. Um, online. And then to answer the question about, you know, how did I think they learned more? It was because the level of detail and depth and explanation they gave, the design of their circuits, like now compared to what it was just last spring, um, was like night and day. I mean, they were, it was, they were able to answer questions that they'd never even thought about before. You know, it, even to the extent of, oh, if we wanted to actually you know, do this in the real world, we would have to be concerned that not everyone could afford this. And so we would have to think about, you know, what would be a cost effective way to do it to we can't just release this out into the environment. So here's our design. These are not engineering students. These are bioscience students. And they were they in their proposals, they were showing me design of how they would actually have a self contained system that would actually be put into the environment to actually deliver their product. So they were thinking in ways that they haven't thought before. So it was actually going way beyond just here's what I want to build. Now let me work on it. So um, the products that they, you know, throughout the semester, the, the products that they shared actually helped show me that. And then the other thing I added, which we had not done before was, the they had to evaluate the work of others that was in this field and so they had to really think about what makes this a good project you know is it scientifically sound and valid if i was giving money would i support this and okay yeah this is good science but what's the impact on society and kind of the world as a whole so they had to actually think beyond the bench and so i think they got a much um more in-depth broader perspective by working on it this way than they had in the past Mm -hmm. Yeah, for, for me, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I really have a way of comparing the outcomes of the, the virtual labs versus the in-person labs in any quantifiable way. But, um, you know, I, I do survey the students uh, every semester and ask them for their feedback in addition to the normal surveys that the university asked them to complete and and the students were actually surprisingly positive in their in their feedback about how they felt the classes went and i don't know quite what to make of that i think maybe in some ways that's just their expectations were very low <laughs> i don't think they expected these classes to be very good at all and so the fact that they you know weren't terrible i guess means that they were the students were happy but <clears throat> um but in terms of how i evaluate individual students in a group context, um, you know, I, I always ask the students to evaluate their own, to do a self-reflection where they evaluate their own contributions. And I ask them to evaluate the contributions of their team members. And then I compare those. Um, and so I normally do that even when we're working in person and, and we did the same thing here. And what I find is usually they match up pretty well, right? So usually the students, if there's somebody who maybe isn't really pulling their, their own weight, <coughs> they usually admit to that and then their their teammates are usually kind of tend to be kind of nice to them and don't rate their the person who wasn't pulling their weight too low but it's but it shows up as lower than than what it would otherwise be and if there's ever any question about whether something went wrong or was there a big fight that happened and people are being unfair then i can go in and i can start actually talking to the students and finding out what went wrong but usually that's not necessary and Okay. Something that I, oh, I was just going to add to comment on Scott's talking about they're evaluating each other. So something that I have um, my students do in all of my lab courses, and we were doing this pre-COVID, and so it actually, you know, is as applicable regardless of whether it's virtual or face-to-face. -face, is at the very beginning of the semester, um, after they know, like I assign the team, so they know which team they're on. Um, I have each team create their own group contract or team agreement where basically they lay out um, how they're going to work as a group. So how are they going to meet? Um, 
What are they, you know, how are they going to work on assignments that are team-based assignments? How do they prepare for lab? What happens if there's a conflict? How do they resolve it? You know, when do they come to me? Or, you know, and so each group does their own. And then I basically, um, throughout the semester, remind them, all right, you know, go back and look at your contract and are, are, is each group member kind of holding up to that contract? And so since I started having them do that, then the group work has actually really improved because now they, they all have to sit there and really think about, you know, what does it mean to be, you know, a contributing member of the group and to, to, to contribute equally? You know, it kind of holds them accountable uh, because they basically have laid out for themselves, this is how we're going to work together as a group. And there's still bumps and there's still hiccups along the way, but usually they are able to resolve those issues themselves. And only rarely has, does it escalate to where they have to come to me and say, we need help because we have someone that is not contributing. And so I think this was even more valuable in the online environment. I mean, they even put into their contracts like, you know, what happens if we lose internet? You know, we will make sure we have multiple ways to reach out to each other. And so they, they, I think it actually was very valuable for them to think about, you know, in this new learning environment, how they were actually going to work together. So. So, okay. I think uh, with this, we, we are ending our, our session, our lunch session here, here in San Carlos, here in Brazil. Uh, because we, we have something like 10 or 15 minutes to, to start the, the afternoon session, okay? That we do a, we're going to do a, a, like a, a live uh, problem learn class, okay? So we're going to do like a Big Brother uh, live class. Uh, so we have 10 or 15 minutes. And I would like to thank you, both of you, very much to accept our invitation in the, in the name of the organizers. And uh, we, we had to struggle a little bit with this change from, from last um, Thursday to, to Monday. But thankfully, we, we could do uh, this presentation of, of you, which was very, very rich for us. I wrote down a lot of, of ideas for, for our lab classes. And I hope that we can, we can use uh, your, your ideas here, OK? If Fred wants to do some final comments. And I would like to, to uh, just to finish. I would like to have some some final words of Scott uh, in Portuguese, if possible. Okay, Scott. So Fred, <laughs> Fred, and then Scott, <laughs> please. Well, I'd like to thank you both as well. It was uh, really interesting for me to learn your your experiences, and uh, I'm sure you know, our audience will use most of the ideas, particularly the uh, guiding principles for our remote labs. This was uh, you know quite a, a very nice tip, I would say. Uh, I believe that you have discussed that together and you agreed on that and uh, we're going to do the same over here. And yeah, you know, I'll pass it on to you and thanks again. Okay, muito obrigado para todos. Foi um prazer. Tem boa sorte. Muito obrigado. Okay. So, bye bye. See you. Ciao. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, Augusto, posso dar um último recado para a gente avisar o pessoal que vai assistir as palestras que é, nós vamos encerrar essa sessão, então quem quiser assistir a sessão a partir das 14 horas tem que entrar no site na sessão sexta-feira à tarde quer dizer, vai entrar em outra sala para poder assistir a sessão da oficina eu acho que era isso, né Fred? Isso Tá legal, segunda tarde, né? Sessão de segunda tarde, obrigado <risos> Obrigado, Augusto.